you want to become a guitar tech, I'm going to give you the best way to change strings in the fastest. You cut them off, take them all out at once. This happens to be a Fender Telecaster, which I consider the easiest guitar to change strings on. I used to have to change 15 guitars a day. The best way to do it is to do it early in the morning. Make sure you get to your gear as soon as possible. Do all your, all your stringing as early as possible so the strings will be stretched up by the time sound check comes around. So you're a great player and you're going broke. And you really feel like facing reality? Go on the road, get a job. The best way to go about it is to find friends that are already on the road that know that you can play guitar because being a great player will make you a great tech if you put your uh, pride aside it will make it a lot easier we'll place the strings through the holes all six at a time it's really the fastest and you don't waste any time We almost have the six strings in. It's really important that when you string your guitar, you'll stretch the strings. Always do plenty of stretching before your guy gets to play it. You don't want him to be doing the sound check and have the guitar go out of tune. The only way you're gonna do that is by stretching the strings properly. That's something that I will teach you in a moment. It's always good to cut the strings, especially on Fender guitars, around three inches ahead of your tuning peg. Once you have all your strings pre-cut, then it will be very easy to thread the strings. Wind them all at once, and worry about tuning it later. If you have many guitars to do, it's a good idea to do this all at once. Then you can come through each guitar. The E string is the only string that I will not cut because I like to have as much length as possible, especially on the high strings. Those will be the ones will, that will be bent and the ones that will stretch the most. So I'll wrap it by hand first to save time. Hold it down with my index finger and wind away. Now you see how fast we get done? I prefer the Boss Chromatic Tuner because it gives me a sound mode so I can get close without having to be in my stroke tuner. We're gonna get close as possible and then we'll go back and tune it through the stroke tuner. So you're still real close, you still must stretch the strings as much as possible. Make sure you don't stretch them right out of the guitar. It's really important to know your player's habits, especially the way he bends the strings. It's really good to do the same thing as he does. So when he gets a guitar, he feels like he's been playing it all along. If you have to change the strings every day like I had to, it's really important to stretch as much as possible. See? Keeps on stretching, we'll keep on tuning. After stretching the strings over and over and over and tuning time after time, it's really important that you play as much as possible like your guy plays the guitar. Do the same bendings. It's really helpful to know the songs. Know your player's habits. So you can do the same thing. So when he grabs the guitar, he'll feel like he's been playing the guitar all day long.
You can go as far as to measure the strength in his hands, just to know how much he's bending or how strong he really is. It's intonation time, so here we are again. We're going to show you some tuners. This one's you may find anywhere. The stroke tuner is my favorite. First, we're going to start by checking your neck. Place your finger on the first fret and another finger on the last fret. Check in between to see how much clearance you have. You shouldn't have more than a sixteenth of an inch. Looks fine to me. We're going to check it. Now, I'm going to show you something. I will intonate the guitar first. and then move it and you will see a drift. You can see the movement in the stroke tuner coincide with the movement on the guitar. That's the reason why you should never intonate your guitar while it's lying down. You should have it on your lap or standing up just as if you were playing the guitar. Now the idea is to get that little stroke tuner in there to stop. If it's sharp, it will go to the right. If it's flat, it will go to the left. The idea is to stop right dead center. First you tune the guitar open, and next you will press your 12th fret. It shows that it's flat. That means that your bridge has to go forward towards the neck. And we'll use a Phillips screwdriver for that one. Once again, we're going to place the guitar on our lap. We're getting closer. or as close as ever gonna get. Now that we have calibrated the bridge by matching the open string to the fretted string at the 12th fret, let's talk about the neck for a while. If your neck is concave, which is like this, simply turn that screw clockwise. You have to take the pig guard off first. I would recommend that so you don't destroy the pig guard. If it's convex, which is this way, simply loosen it and see what happens. I'm going to teach you another trick now. If you're breaking too many strings at the bridge, chances are that it's because of the tension of the string coming through the bridge. We're going to take some wire, we're going to cut the insulation off, and we're going to use it for that purpose. Now watch this. No sense on saving that string. It was old. We cut about an inch. Insert it through the back. And we'll use a little piece of insulation. And as you can see, that little piece of insulation will keep us from having any friction against the bridge. You're getting a lot of buzz at the nut, and you're really thinking about changing your nut, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Think about it twice, because there's something you can do. I'm about to show you the greatest trick I know. Simply take a little bit of baking soda, place it in the groove, 
and a little drop of crazy glue. Make sure you tape your neck to protect it from the crazy glue. Once it t touches the uh, lacquer, that will be it. And a little bit more baking soda. Then you file it, regroove it, we're ready. By combining crazy glue and baking soda, we were able to come up with a harder surface than the nut itself. Now we're going to use an exacto saw. You can use anything sharp, like a razor blade or even a string. Cut exactly where the old groove was. Take your time. Make sure you leave the tape in there. No more buzz. That's playtime. back from the dressing room and my guy tells me his guitar is making funny noises so let's see what's happening inside have a visual inspection we shall find something in here if we don't we know that it has to be inside the guitar cord or perhaps the amplifier itself we'll look around we'll poke around make sure that all the soldering joints are nice and tight and shiny nothing is loose there are no pieces of wire in between the connections Let's spray the pots. Make sure they're clean before putting it back. Some guitars are harder to take apart, like Stratocasters. They usually have eight screws or more. You have to take the strings off. So working on the Telecaster is a real blessing. We'll put the screws back in, then we'll get back to the stage and try the guitar. We talked about the pots being dirty in your amp once before, and I told you the cause and the remedy. Let's examine this guitar pot to see if it needs replacing. Now watch the needle. There's a slight jump in it. That means the dead spot's in there. It really will definitely need to be replaced. If you try cleaners and they don't work, try the analog meter. It'll tell you immediately. There are two basic designs to the electric guitar. The Fender type design and the Gibson type design. The fenders can be accessed through the front and the Gibsons will be accessed through the back. The value of the potentiometers or pots in the Gibson guitars will be 500,000 ohms. In the Fender type will be 250,000 ohms. Something very important to remember. Let's go over our basic tools, which are 22 gauge solder, flathead screwdriver, a quarter inch nut driver, very important, wire cutters, gauss meter, which we will really need to use measuring the strength of our pickups. Can't do it any other way. Hemostats, and a Phillips screwdriver. We have gone through our basic tools, but this is one friend that you really need. You can't go anywhere without it. It's your volt ohm meter. There are many like it. But this one is mine. Most meters have three and a half digit scales. This one happens to have four and a half digit. I really highly recommend this fluke. We will use it to measure resistance, which basically a pickup is a resistor. So we'll put it on the 20,000 ohm scale, which is the nearest scale to 6,000 ohms, which most pickups are. So we'll take it from zero to 20,000 ohm and see what we have. Rhythm pickup reads 5200 ohms. Lip pickup reads 7420. That's very natural. The pickups read, that means that the problem is not in the pickup, so it's probably in the strength of the magnets. So we'll use the Gauss meter for this problem. 
that's really quite high this is kind of low if we had to take it out all we would have to do would be to put it in between the magnetizer jaws throw in the switch just one second that would do it we'll measure back and we'll notice that yes it's full strength it's a really simple procedure hey so there you are again so you're in the middle of the road and you're having trouble with your pickup I'm gonna show you a few real good tricks and this is strictly for emergencies only you should definitely send your pickup to be rewound by a qualified person first we're gonna start by scraping the wire just where the wire goes into the connecting holes see if we get a reading there's no reading so we're gonna have to cut into the coil well you need an exacto knife you cut into the coil you're gonna get a screw and stick it inside that little hole in the center of your pickup coil so far we have used two of our basic tools the ohm meter and the exacto knife now we're gonna introduce a third one to rewind this coil it's a variable speed drill put the coil in we'll tighten it up this is the tool that you may have if you don't have one get one I have to tell you that this is not the way to do it but if you really must get that pickup rewound this is the only way if you happen to be in the middle of the road you can always get a drill take the spool 42 gauge wire put it on the floor preferably on top of a box and hand guide it very easy when you get to the point that visually looks fat enough or kinda like the old coil looked you have to test it right here we're gonna scrape a little bit of wire okay should be marked just by the fact that you were scraping right there we'll take our first layer scrape there as well you can always take off but you can never add once you cut that coil forget about it so let's check out to see if we overwound or to see if we underwound It sometimes takes a little while. We have a reading, 6400 ohms. We did great. We'll take it off. And guess what? Next we're gonna dip it in hot wax. It's what we call potting. This will seal the coil nice and tight, air free. When air gets in between your coil windings, it'll make it vibrate just like a motor. Remember, a coil or, or um, a pickup is just the same thing as a motor. After feeding your wire three times through each eyelet, we will test first by soldering make sure it's nice and hot so you can melt insulation in the wire so you can get a clear reading make sure to always have a nice little fan to blow that lead smoke away from you. It's really not good for you at all. You definitely don't want much more than 6,000 ohms on your Fender type pickups. 
if you really like to preserve the fender sound. And it's really helpful to make a diagram on which uh, color wire went where. Okay, we made our connections. We'll test again. There we go. We have a clear reading. Next we're going to pot the pickup or dip it in wax. This is what we call a double boiler, which is a pot of water with a pot of hot wax. Uh, if you're on the road and you don't have your own hot plate, I really recommend that you should go and find the nearest kitchen to do this. You really want to ask first because some people really get upset about having wax all over the place. We'll dip it in hot wax and we'll watch for them little bubbles that come up. That's the air. You want to put it in there until all bubbles are gone. It should take about 10, uh, 10 to 15 minutes at the most. Okay, after all bubbles are gone, just remove your coil. Remember, if it's too hot for your finger, it's too hot for your coil. We're going to wait a few minutes until it gets a little bit colder or cooler. And uh, we're going to dip it a few more times just to get a nice coat on it. But that's pretty much it. And it should be a wonderfully sounding pickup. You notice we also have a syringe on our side. Sometimes we use a syringe to shoot hot wax inside the coil. But that's not something that you really have to do every day. I recommend that uh, with Telecaster pickups. If you're dipping humbucking coils, make sure you don't dip in too long because they're made out of plastic and they will warp. Same thing for P90s. How to get into that first tour? The hardest thing to do is to get into that first tour. Since you're already a musician, chances are that you already know somebody who has been on the road or who's going on the road. Make yourself his or her best friend. Make yourself indispensable. Know how to delegate. Know all your music stores. Keep a list of every single music store that you have ever dealt with. That is the hardest thing to get on that first tour. Once you've been on the road, everybody's glad to have you because you already have experience. But remember, experience is something that you cannot buy. You have to earn it. In this tape, I'm not only going to teach you how to get along with other members of the crew, but I will also teach you how to service guitars and amps. Having the knowledge on how to work on everything will land your feet safely on the road. And once you do that first tour, you can do many more and you can stay on the road as long as possible. We worked on the guitars, now we're going to work on the good stuff. This is about as simple as it can get, it's a Fender amp and all fender amps will have a back, an upper back and two brackets on top. Just simply remove the screws, four screws on the back, four screws on the top, slide the head out, make sure you put your parts right back where they were so you don't lose them. And put the head on top of the workbench and we'll get to the filter caps. The filter caps will hold up to 500 volts DC. That's no fun in games. We'll begin by placing a screwdriver between the chassis and the red wire. Discharge all your filter caps. In this case, all the filter caps are placed on the other side, underneath a safety can. Play voltage in these wires is up to 450 volts. 
You definitely don't want to discharge that with your arm. Now that we have found that there's no more charge in the filter caps, we're ready for the tune-up. We'll begin our tune-up and maintenance by first blowing all dust. Make sure you get rid of all that dust inside. Look inside, make sure there are no wires anywhere. That's kind of like a contradiction itself because there are plenty of wires in there. Second, we're going to spray the pots. As I said before, cremoline is just ideal. Next, we make sure we rotate them around. We'll turn it around. We'll take the preamp tubes. Let's make sure that we'll leave the preamp tubes in perfect order. And we'll spray cremolin inside the sockets. You don't have to do the power tubes. It's really not necessary. Next, we're going to place the tubes back in. Shake them a bit. And next, we're going to turn the amp on just to see how it sounds. Begin the bias of the amp by first setting your meter on the DC volts maximum setting, the highest setting you can get. This is what we call the phase inverter, and it's the very first tube next to the power tubes. And now we're going to trace pin number five on the power tube section. This is not the true way to bias an amplifier, but most manufacturers will give you a bias number, and that's just close enough. We have the amplifier on, our voltmeter set up on the highest setting on the DC. Pin number 5 says minus 50, it should be minus 52. A lot of amps will have preset bias, but most of them will have a bias control. In this case, this amplifier is set at minus 52. So we'll find the minus 52. We'll check the other tube just to make sure that it's working. And we also have minus 52. So you turn the amplifier on and you're blowing your fuse. There's a thing that you can do before you take it to the repairman. It's very simple. If you turn it on, blows the fuse, and it doesn't smell funky, chances are that the power tubes are bad. Simply take your power tubes out of the amp, put a new fuse on it, turn it back on. If it blows the fuse, then that means that your power transformer is bad. If it doesn't blow the fuse, that means that your tubes are bad. Take, it, take the tubes out of another amp, place them in, turn it on. If it doesn't blow the fuse, you know you found the solution. Now, talking about testing of the tubes. Tube testers are fine to find out if your power tubes are good or bad. And if you're into esoterics, you can find out all kinds of nice things about your tubes. But the real true way to test your tube is to put it in your amp, turn it on, and listen to them. If they sound nice and strong, but they have some kind of noise like microphonics, then that tube is no good. So simply change it. So you suspect that it is the power tubes that's causing your amplifier to blow the fuse. Take it out, smell the base. Most of the time a tube that's blowing fuses will really smell bad. 
place them back in. When it comes to microphonics, you can get a high pitched noise on the preamp tubes and you can get a low rumble on the power tubes. We'll begin by turning the amplifier on full blast and we'll tap on the power tubes. If you can hear low rumble noise, it's time to change your tubes. Now we're going to tap on the preamp tubes. There you go. That's what we're talking about. Now that happens to be a brand new tube. There's no guarantee when you buy brand new tubes. An old tube that's good is a good tube. We have to get this guy out of here and put another new one in. The only true way to test a filter capacitor is to use a capacitance meter such as this BNK A20. I don't expect you to have one just like it. You can pick one up for around $250. Now we'll put it aside. Oh, by the way, this is what a Marshall filter cap looks like. The same principles apply to all filter caps. So let's look inside the can, see what we'll find. If you see any capacitors that have a bubble in front, chances are it's very close to being shot. You have to change that one, as well as resistors that are burnt, such as this two. A real good test, if you don't have a capacitance meter, is to turn your amplifier on and use a brand new filter cap as a probe. You'll need an alligator clip, to ground. A real good practice when you're working on your amp is to keep your hand or to keep one, one arm behind your back at all times. Discharge, come back. In the event of a hum, you would have found it by doing that. Now let's turn it off. Unplug and discharge. Hey, what do we have in here? Two resistors that really look funky. Let's find out what the values are. Your amp will lose all its power if these two resistors are in really bad shape. The first one should be 1000 ohms. So we'll put our meter on the DC resistance from 0 to 20,000 ohm scale. We'll test the first resistor supposed to be 1000 ohms it's really much higher almost twice that much the next one is supposed to be 4700 ohms it's only reading 754 ohms this is where our problem lies we'll replace the resistors and the amp will sound like brand new Another thing I'd like you to know is these two resistors on top of the power tubes, they call screen grid resistors. On fender amps they always go bad because they're made out of carbon. As you may notice, these ones were changed for wire one resistors, which is okay. The value on the fender amp will be 470 ohms. The value on the Marshall amp will usually be 1000 ohms. You should take a resistance reading on that one in there just to make sure that you have the right value. I've made tons of money out of that noise. And that's something you can fix yourself. You have to check all your grounds when you open up your amp. This one is disconnected. Remember that time that your amplifier gave up and you lost all your power? You took it in, the guy charged you $100 to fix it? was your ground strap. You could have done it yourself. We'll turn it off, we'll solder it, and it will be just as new.
That sounds kind of thin, doesn't it? I'm going to show you a trick to find out whether your speakers are in phase or out of phase. Now check it out. Get a simple 9 volt battery, has a cross on the one side, that's your positive. Get your quarter inch jack for the speaker, place a positive on the front, negative on the back, and observe your speakers. You will notice one goes in, the other one goes out. Okay, to fix this problem, simply go on the back of the speaker and find your positive and your negative. The white wire should always be the positive, the black wire should be the negative. Place a white wire on the positive and the black on the negative. Now that really made a great big difference in sound. Hey, come with me. I got something real neat to show you. It's a whole collection of effects, literally from the past, from the distant 60s past. Actual relics of rock and roll. Now the reason why I have brought them in front of you is to explain to you how they work. First we have the Octavia, the Vox Wawa pedal, and the Uni Vive. Each one has a different amount of gain. And it's really very important to put them in the right place because otherwise you'll have too much gain in one place and not enough on the other. You'll have to spend literally hours and hours. Now, some guitar player that you may be working for may come up with a bunch of effects and he'll just throw them at you and it's up to you to make him sound great. Here's a copycat, it's a tube echo unit. Unfortunately, we can't use it because it has way too much gain for our application right now. So we're gonna have to leave it out of the picture. Now, Hendrix uses the same exact setup and you may recognize some of the sounds. And here we have the Octavia, which works better when you don't have quite so much gain. It also works better when you play two notes or more. But it doesn't work so great by itself. You have to give it a little bit of wow. And a little univibe. The acoustic guitar is a bit different than the electric guitar and a lot of people will tell you that it's really not a good thing to break the strings all at once. I'll tell you one thing, I was always in a hurry and I had plenty to do. So unless your guitar player is a real maniac that really needs to have it done a certain way, you're definitely not there to argue with your artist. Do it the way he wants it to be done. If he doesn't see you, do it your way. We'll take all the strings out and we'll restring the guitar with brand new strings. Have you noticed a little peg on the side of your string winder? Is to take. It's very important to place your 
bridge pegs in the same place where they came out of. Different thickness strings will make a different groove on each peg. You definitely want to use the same one over and over and over. If you don't, they'll just pop out. Hold your pegs down and pull on all the strings as hard as possible. You should hear a small click. That means that they're locked in place. Now you can remove the strings from the top. And we're ready to wind. Insert all the strings through the bottom of the peg. Your high strings will have what I call the Martin lock, which is to bend them in, over, under, grab, and you can see. Let's repeat that. There you have it. We strung up two guitars, an electric guitar and an acoustic guitar. They both strung the same way, and except for the pegs and the bridge having to go back in the same place, there's no actual difference. They play the same way, they're tuned the same way, and they're stretched the same way. I originally became a guitar tech because first, I was a musician, Second, I was looking for that big break. And third, I was facing reality. Business was slow. I couldn't find work as a musician. So I realized that I could work behind the scenes, just like you too can. It's really important to remember that it's really good to have the ability to be able to service guitars as well as amps. And if you're a musician already, it's the easiest thing to do. There were many situations where they, make, they were making cutbacks and they wanted to get rid of half of the crew. And the only reason why they didn't get, they didn't get rid of me is because I knew how to fix amplifiers. You don't have to do things yourself like fixing a bridge or a neck or even fixing amplifier and change transformers. What's really important to remember here is how to delegate your work, how to get someone to do it for you. In fact, I know plenty of famous guitar techs that never did an ounce of work, that were excellent at getting somebody at the local music store to do it for them. Just get in touch with production when you have a problem. Make sure you have it done by the next day and always stay one step ahead. Don't wait for anyone to tell you what to do. Think of the worst thing that could ever happen. Always have your tools ready and anticipate. That's the whole secret of becoming a guitar tech. You're not there to argue with anyone. It takes you a lot longer to argue with that person than it takes you to actually perform the actual task that they're asking you to perform. Let's talk tubes once again. But first, let me reach into my bag of tricks and introduce a new tool, a dental tool. You can use something pointed just the same. The first and most common problem with tube amplifiers will be the tube sockets. 
simply insert your dental tool in between the contacts and just press together. Do every single one and you will notice a world of difference. And here are some more tricks. If you're having trouble with your Fender amp, for example, the vibrato, that's one thing you can do. You can test the foot switch for continuity with your own meter. And if it still doesn't work, open up the amp, check over here where you see there are two parts wrapped with shrink tubing. The light should go on and it should be blinking. And this is what it should sound like. <laughs> If you don't see the light blinking, chances are that the photo cell is bad. In that case, you will have to replace one. You can always call me to get one. Move all parts around. Make sure that everything is connected. Check all solder joints. Check your grounds. It's always a real good idea that the first inspection should be in the ground straps. Look behind your pots, which are clearly marked speed and intensity. Make sure that that 100,000 ohm resistor it's connected to ground. Check the blue wire going right into the chassis. This is what it sounds like and this is what it looks like. To slow down your vibrato simply take a capacitor, start with a 0.1 value and work your way down to 0.01. These are the caps that will control your speed. Go through each one, and it's pretty much up to your taste. You can see we can really slow it down. If you don't like the speed, you can definitely make it slower. We've all heard the sound before. That only means that this speaker is blown. We should take a test on it, make sure that it is indeed blown. Simply place hands underneath the speaker, pull back and forth. If you hear this sound, which means that the cone is distorted, or a similar sound, then you should have the speaker replaced or recone. So you're on the road and you suspect your amplifier is not putting up his full power? That's one simple test you can do. If you don't have your meter, no problem. If you have a 100 watt amp, use a 100 watt light bulb. Fixture, quarter inch jack connected to the speaker jack. Simply play high note. If it doesn't light up, you know you're not getting your 100 watts of power. Take it to your local technician. So you've been banging your head against the workbench trying to figure out why your reverb is not working? Chances are that it's something real simple, like the transducer wires. This is strictly the main cause for all reverb failures. Simply take your ohm meter, test for continuity on the cables first, put the cables back into the tank, and test each side. Place your meter on the DC resistance mode on the 2000 scale. One side should be close to 1 ohm, the other side should be close to 200 ohms. If that works, and you still don't get reverb, get inside the amp, look right over here for a 2200 ohm resistor. If it's burnt, you have to replace it. If this capacitor is bad, you have to replace it. Check your transformers. Check the blue wire, check the red wire for voltage. If you still have some trouble with this reverb, take it to your local repairman. He'll know what to do.
The Vibromaster is perhaps the most clever piece of equipment I have ever designed. I've designed a few amps, like 100 watt and 30 watt. The, the Vibromaster was built out of pure necessity. It was 1989, and Dylan had come out with Oh Mercy. I was guitar tech for Dylan as well as G.E. Smith. G.E. used basement heads with showman bottoms, and I knew there was no way that he could ever go into playing through another amp, especially one with tremolo. So I decided to go home and design the Vibromaster, which incorporates tremolo as well as vibrato and reverb. This was the missing link that we needed to complete the tour. I took the first prototype to GE. He totally went wild with it. We took it on the road immediately. We kept it on the road for a year and a half without any repairs, no hassles. It was a complete success. To me, solid state is uh, it's nothing but a myth because most of the time, their biggest enemy will be heat. And uh, there's heat around us all the time. When you put the solid state equipment inside a truck, it's only gonna heat up because you have to leave the equipment in there overnight or for a few days, however days you have off, however many days you will have off. So chances are that the equipment will overheat. Uh, also, the parts are incredibly hard to replace. Uh, Access-wise, it's really nothing that's, very, that's too friendly for the consumer. Uh, what I really like about tubes is that tubes are the closest thing to a human life I've ever come across. A tube will heat up and it will give you a different sound than when it cools down. Uh, it just reacts like a character in the person. If it's happy, it'll sound a certain way. If it's unhappy, it'll sound terrible. They're also very durable. You can get them just about anywhere. Unfortunately, many brands are going out of business in the United States, so therefore we have to deal with European or Chinese tubes, which don't make the best kind of tube. Uh, it's pretty much up to you, the guitar tech, to find a good source for NOS, new old stock, which is still available. Go to ham fairs or contact audio files and find your best source for tubes. You should always have plenty of them in hand. Make sure you don't run out, always stay ahead. Change your tubes often. Make sure you tap him every once in a while, check for microphonics, and you'll never have any trouble. Good. 